we go. A very good morning to you, Grenada and the rest of the world. Today, the 16th day of May, 2019. I'm George Grant, uh, welcoming you to today's edition. Uh, good day, Grenada. Folks, folks, uh, this morning I spent some time out there on the balcony taking a look uh, to see if that ship was still in here. The ship that came in here a couple of days ago, they're involved in uh, laying a fiber optic cable. And they had a media conference, which I was not able to attend this week, and uh, they're gone, they're gone. But it's still a beautiful sunny morning here in the Spice. Let's take a look at the rundown. We're gonna provide you this morning with an introduction to the Chinese Navy. Ha, Yaman, the Chinese Navy. Wait a sec. We're also going to show you the faces of Singaporean kids who heard yesterday's letter. We read a letter to you that was sent to us by good old John out there in Kariuku. And, uh, well, you'll find out a bit about that in just a moment. We do have the national report for you. And, of course, that's going to be followed by Mr. A.B. Alan Bezinski. Yes, sir. Haven't heard anything from him to the contrary, so I'm assuming he's going to be joining us by Zoom this morning. And right at the end of this morning's program, um, I, uh, I want to take a moment to have a little heart-to-heart -heart with you. It's my way of saying thank you. Thank you. Okay? So we'll do that at the end of this morning's program. Now, let's get down to brass stacks. What time is it? 9.02? I really do not consider Grenada Broadcast to be a news site, okay? Although I know that many of you do. Rather, I try to provide information which like-minded persons may consider of interest. As such, what I do is I grab little titbits here and there and share them with you, okay? Now, I'm not quite sure why I'm about to show you this video, but somehow I just felt compelled to. It's just a tiny glimpse at the naval arsenal which the Chinese have at their disposal. And at the rate things are evolving these days in this insane world of ours, those weapons may be put into use sooner rather than later. Just some food for thought. I want you to take a look.
kind of scary, eh? Kind of scary. Uh, in an effort to educate, like some of you say we do here, I thought I'd run that by you this morning. Hope you found it educational. Now, let me say good morning to the pilgrims out here. TF is saying good morning and good morning, Tanties and compares. I haven't heard that term in a long time, TF. Thanks for bringing it up again. Compare. Uh, Fitzroy's there. John says, uh, can I be excused from attending class as I have a job to do for someone? Pretty please? Okay, John, you're a good guy. Good guy. So you're excused. No big deal. Don't have to bring a note signed by your mom. Benedict, is <laughs> Benedict has a title for every thirst, every day of the week. So he's referring today as Thriving Thursday. Absolutely. Margaret says, uh, busy day here today. Uh, don't know if that's a tip-off that she's not going to be able to spend uh, her morning with us, as she usually does. But thanks for checking in, Mags. Peter Bishop saying good morning. And Benedict says here, not China alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, listen, we even have our little navy here. The Dolly Sea, the Amelia, uh, the Osprey. <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, uh, Chester, good morning, Uncle Chess. How you doing, man? Um, Sharon says, good morning, George and family. They have good reason for showing off what they're capable of. Very scary. Yes, girl, it is. Anthony DeRig says, looking at these weapons, I see frightening times ahead. Yaman. That's why I just wanted to draw that to your attention this morning. Things ain't looking too good. He goes on to say, I believe man will use them when push comes to shove. And it's getting close to that point. It's getting close to that point. Kipling also says, good morning and God's blessings to one and all. Uh, he says, enjoy God's greatest gift, life. Absolutely. And you, Kippy, have a lot to be thankful for, my friend. Sharon says, uh, <laughs> I'm sitting here shaking. The more Donald Tuck, <laughs> Don Sharon, the man's name is Donald Trump, no, not Donald Tuck. The more Donald Tuck talk crap, the more danger he's putting the country in. Not just the country, uh, Sharon, the world. Lincoln Roberts says, uh, good day to everyone. Be the light in someone's life today. Yes, absolutely, Linky. Margaret says, Sharon, I'm not scared about them having it as much as I'm scared about them using it. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, the idea of mutually assured destruction was enough to keep the superpowers at bay. Today, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Mags, those words speak volumes, girl. T.F. Richard says, the world has become a big video game. Just sit and push buttons and his old mass. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you guys can sleep tonight after this. Uh, Oswald Pele Darbo saying good morning, and so was Donna Joseph. Now, folks, yesterday, I read a letter to you which was written to the parents of Singaporean students who were preparing to sit exams. That letter was sent to me as a JPEG by our buddy out there in Kariku, John, and I read it to you. Well, this morning, I am pleased to report that last night I got my hands on a video of that story. It's even more emotional than what you heard yesterday. Right now, take a look. Okay, students, settling down. Settling down, thank you. You are about to begin your exams. These exams are going to define you. The grades you get are going to determine which sixth form, which university and which job you will be able to get into. These exams are exceedingly important and I want you to take them seriously. These exams will determine what you become in life.
Sorry, miss. This was a letter written by a head teacher in Singapore. I think it's really important for the teachers, your parents, and for you to hear. Dear parents, the exams of your children are to start soon. I know you're really anxious for your child to do well. But please do remember, amongst the students who will be sitting for their exams, there's an artist who doesn't need to understand math. There's an entrepreneur who doesn't care about history or English literature. There's a musician whose chemistry marks won't matter. There's a sports person whose physical fitness is more important than their grade in physics. If your child does get top marks, that's great. But if he or she doesn't, please don't take away their self-confidence and their dignity from them. Tell them it's okay. It's just an exam. They are cut out for much bigger things in life. Tell them no matter what they score that you love them and don't judge them. Please do this and when you do, watch your children conquer the world. One exam or low mark won't take away their dreams or their talent. And please do not think that doctors and engineers are the only happy people in the world. With warm regards, the principal. And here's my message. Exams are important, but they're not everything. Grades are good, but they don't define you. Don't let one exam or one grade define your whole future. There is so much more potential right inside of you. And remember, as Albert Einstein said, everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing that it's stupid. Don't let other people's metrics of success become yours. All right, there you have it. Not much to be said, uh, except there's a note here from Benedict. Benedict says to me, as I said yesterday, his letters taken out of context, if taken out of context, could be misleading. This is why we end up with bankrupt celebrities, etc. Joycey Smith is saying good morning, and so is Carla Clement. And you know, this... <laughs> I'm a little bit anxious to get to Mr. Bajinski this morning, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn things around a little bit, and instead of making him sit there and wait until we go through the national report, I'm going to go directly to Mr. Bajinski right now. <laughs> the, re hi, uh, yeah. the reason why I'm laughing... Good morning, Mr. Bajinski. Good morning. Um, um, Mr. B... Can, you, can you hear me this morning? Oh, I can hear you loud and clear this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. B, <laughs> Mr. B, please, sir, please. I think I know you well enough to take a, take a shot here. Are you having a bad hear day? <laughs> Actually, I've been unable to uh, arrange a visit with my stylist. Well, you have been. You know, I'm sitting here. I, I saw you come on the monitor here this morning, and it seems to me like you know there are little pieces of hair, like it's kind of windy out there, and there are little pieces of hair <laughs> standing up. And I thought, Alan is I've, having. I've, I've decided. I've decided. I'm. I'm going to try and grow an afro on the fringe. Oh, okay. Okay. Ah, uh, oh, Mr. Ah, uh, Mr. Bajinski, Mr. Bajinski. So, how are you this morning, sir? I am well. I've had um, a fairly extensive route march this morning, early, where upon um, I was only stopped once by a motorist who wished to inform me that a comment I had made with regard to illegal dumping in the Mount Hartman area might well be attributable to the activities of certain Far Eastern um, immigrants. 
to the country. Uh -huh. um, now, I have no way of verifying this, but the information was volunteered to me by a member of the public. Actually, what I found interesting about it was that he said he had considered calling in on a certain radio program, but that his sister knows his voice, as I'm sure she should, <laughs> but that for that reason, he didn't call in. This, this leads me to suspect that his sister is an irrational supporter of certain activities in the country, and he is not. Okay. Mr. B, Mr. <laughs> B, let me, let, me, <laughs> let me interrupt you for, uh, let me interrupt you here for a minute. Um, Alan, you're not going to believe this. You came on this morning and everything was fine. I mean, they were hearing you. Uh, I mean, they're saying good morning to you and all that stuff. Would you believe, Mr. Bajinsky, that the audio is fine, no issue there. But worst of all, sir, we no longer have an internet connection to Facebook. <laughs> well, th th this this suggests to me that someone doesn't like you, like me. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, I, I was I've been on the air every day so far this week. Uh, look <laughs> look at the comments that are showing up here. Um, Anthony says, uh, oh, "Hold on a minute." Um, Benedict Cador says, "And the problem begins because as soon as you started, Ab." The internet just went, if you take a look, the internet's gone, it's gone, it's gone. Then uh, T.F. Richard says, and here come the internet problems. Huh? Then, uh, <laughs> no, seriously, Margaret, Margaret sitting in New York, she says, Benedict, you notice, eh? Yeah, I mean, this is obvious. Then, um, Peter. So, so the, the, how did you. Um you described this on a previous occasion as you being throttled. Uh, man, this one ain't throttling. This one is... Ah! <laughs> this one's gone. TF says, uh. we still interrupted. Peter Bishop says, this too damn obvious. Kipling says, I smell a rat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> Donna Joseph says, the internet is just buffering. A thought flow is saying that we're getting better service and more speed stoops well actually donna this is not uh it's not flow is did you sell thank you it's uh glenna knight says audio gone glenna not just audio gone everything gone because i'm looking at the monitor here on grenada broadcast and it's not there but you know, last week we had a problem where your audio did not get recorded. My my audio went out fine, but yours didn't. Well, today everything's recording just fine, Amy. So the good news is that once you and I are through, we're going to stick it up there on uh, on Facebook anyway, and then we're also it will be accessible. It will be accessible with your audio and your bad hair day. So, Mr. Bajinsky, <laughs> take off, sir. Bung away. Um, there was the official opening of an exhibition at the location of the Parliament building yesterday afternoon. Um, it's called Caribbean Ties, and it's the culmination of work done by archaeologists from Leiden University in Holland, and our own Angus Martin was involved with them in the research over the last two or three years, I think it is. Um, it's a very impressive exhibition. I understand it will be at the House of Parliament for a period of three months. Um, actually, the exhibition will be here for three months. I'm not certain if it will be at the House of Parliament for the entire period or if it's going to move around the island. I was unclear with regard to that aspect of it. But um, you were talking earlier, not talking, there was a segment earlier about the 
importance of not letting passing or failing grades hold anyone back in pursuing knowledge or education. And um, I remember when I was taught Caribbean history, and actually um, I gave up when um, the last teacher I had was the, um, the gentleman who is addressed correctly, I believe, as Sir Dr. Lawrence Joseph or Dr. Sir Lawrence Joseph, I'm not certain. He didn't have all of those um, addresses when he taught us in GBSS. But the syllabus was um, for West Indian history. Basically said that Columbus came, he passed by, and then the French came and they drove the indigenous inhabitants off a cliff in Sartes. And then the British and the French fought with each other for a couple of hundred years. And um, we then had our period of crown colony government followed by internal self-government followed by independence. And basically, that's the history. It had a lot to do with sugar, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And um, the punishments meted out to the enslaved Africans who were brought here and their descendants because they were bred. Clearly, abortion was not something that was encouraged because you needed to produce more humans. Um, but that history more or less ignores the fact that prior to the arrival of the Europeans, who brought measles with them, by the way, which assisted them greatly in wiping out the indigenous populations. But nevertheless, there was a vibrant trading and cultural indigenous population in all of these islands because they moved from the coast of South America all the way up to Cuba. And the evidence of their settlements has been um, most recently extensively studied by this, um, these archaeologists from Holland. And the exhibition reveals a lot of their findings. Naturally, not everything that they discovered could be presented, but there is a magazine called Caribbean Ties. In other words, the ties between all of the territories so that the history that we were not exposed to or let us say that there was just a cursory reference made to them this history this rich history which um which frankly has was there for thousands of years before the Europeans came. Remember, the Europeans have only been an, in this part of the world for the last 600 plus years, not even a thousand. So mm -hmm. the civilizations that existed before that, um, we have not been exposed to much of that history. And I would recommend that anybody who has a couple of hours to spare should take the time to go and acquaint themselves. The purpose of this history is not to say, oh, this is what we should have had, or this is what um, we need to get reparations for, because frankly, who would claim? But in the interest of knowledge, in the pursuit of knowledge, in the understanding of what was here before the books were written. And this is, remember, history is his story. So it is learning about what was here before the Europeans came to these islands. It's, I found it very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I, hope, so I hope so. I hope you will go. Yes, sir. I will. And the venue again? Parliament building. Caribbean ties at the Parliament building. Yeah. Okay. 
Do you know, I'm, I'm probably one of the few people who has yet to go into that building. Well, actually, I shouldn't say go into the building. I have been into the building, but nowhere near the actual auditorium where Parliament sits. Well, actually, that's the point. Um, the exhibition is outside of it, on the, the, <laughs> the area around within the building but within the, the portals of the building okay but not inside the parliament chamber that is off limits so i'm still not gonna get in there oh geez but one of these days i may <laughs> have i may obtain status and be able to get in there alan yeah okay so that's that's your first uh salvo this morning what's next sorry i said that's your first salvo this morning what's next <laughs> <laughs> well, what is next? Now that you've raised the issue of um, inside the hallowed chamber. What's, um, your, what's, we your, were, nick, what's your nickname for that uh, building up there again? I don't... Oh, the white... the white. Did I say a white elephant? I'm not sure. No, no, no. It wasn't white elephant. It was some Disney name, I think it was, that you came up with. Oh, the Magic Kingdom. The, the Magic Kingdom. Yes, sir. Kingdom. The Magic Kingdom. Yes, yeah. Um, so within within the, the hallowed chamber, um, we were entertained by recent um, news coverage of one steel who was um, parading. I mean, it was a theatrical performance of high quality. He was complaining about the fact that... Um, uh, a senator who is representing either youth or something like that um, had dared to comment on the fact that some individuals in Sotheas had reported getting dirty water in their pipe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I get dirty water in my pipe all the time. Yeah. So I know what to do. I let the pipe run and I boil my water. I'm not going to say that by referring to the fact that there is sediment in the water supply, that this is a matter of national security and recklessness. I think he loved the term recklessness. And he, I mean, his performance, as I say, was, was theatrical in the extreme. But then they weren't satisfied with that. The pastor, Winston, doctor, whatever he is. Yeah, 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 yeah. He then backed up the performance. He, he apparently had a secondary role. Um, and one would have thought that they would spend more time addressing substantive issues, as was done by the other ball head who was talking about what we need to do to save the carnage and bring life back to the carnage. Mm. Apparently, he doesn't go on the carnage in a traffic jam because I don't know what life he's talking about, really. No. So, in 30 years, the carnage will be underwater. Well, frankly, with all of this grant money that they apparently are accessing, what I would like to know specifically is not which consultants are going to be paid out of the grant money, but what specifically is going to be done as an engineering solution to prop up the Carinage Roadway where it needs propping up, to reverse the erosion that is taking place by the unauthorized mooring of vessels, and when the dredging of the carinage basin i want to repeat carinage basin because there's one third of it by the fire station across to cable and wireless where there's no basin there again that is just a shallow yeah. shelf yeah yeah and and so every high tide when the waves come in they naturally rise on this narrow shelf and they break over the sidewalk and come into the road. Especially and by the bring... cable and wireless building. Precisely. So, in the old days, when, before we had any, um, any capacity to handle containerized cargo inside the harbor, you remember 
lighters, those large double-ended wooden vessels yeah. which would go out into the stream and they would offload their cargo yeah. before con containerization and they would come back in and you'd have one man in control of these vessels. And these vessels were moored where the guys could get out to them. And that end of the carnage basin was deep. And that is because from time to time, the basin would be dredged. And to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been dredged in possibly over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So all the silt coming down from the surrounding hillsides through the drainage channels is being deposited and naturally it is filling in the basin. So I don't think you need to look for $30 million just to dredge one side of the basin and then do the engineering work that is required on the other side. Remember, we have had this roadway for more than 200 years. In the early 20th century, steam-powered vessels were coming alongside all where Huggins is and, and Hubbard's Lumberyard. That is where commerce took place. And in fact, in those days, the coals from the coals yard would be loaded onto those vessels in that area. Those were vessels, some of them had paddles, the, the paddle steamers. Others had significant drafts as they came alongside. We had deep water there. Now, who is going to bell the cat, as they say, and move these, this multitude, our fishing fleet, move them to Grand Mall where they're supposed to be, and to Guav, where the Japanese have built us these modern facilities in exchange for our vote to, for them to continue slaughtering whales. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what is holding us back from doing the right thing? I don't know. Well, let me let me ask you this. Have, having said what you just did, you, you spend a lot of time talking about the carnage. Are you going down there tomorrow night? Um, Friday night? Yeah. On the carnage? Yeah. I missed it. What's going on oh, there? Oh man, bringing, come on, they're come bringing on. Life, they're bringing life back. Man, uh, listen. Uh, actually, it starts at noon, and I think it's going to go until probably about nine o'clock or so tomorrow night. This has to do, they're trying to promote this uh, climate smart city that they're about to turn the city of St. George's into. And um, one of, they're going to have a whole lot of lectures and stuff, presentations in the afternoon, but apparently in the evening, they're going to put on a display which is supposed to show you what the carnage is going to look like uh, 30 years or so from now. So I thought, I thought, come on, man, I thought you were going to be front row center, Mr. B. Listen, when I want to see science fiction, I go on to Netflix. <laughs> yeah, it's a big do. It's a big do. And if, if you don't want to go on down to the carnage, come sit here on my balcony because uh, I have a pretty good view of the financial complex from where I am. And I imagine there are going to be a sort of a lot of lights. Oh, yes, I forgot the musical entertainment and the food and so on. It's, you know, like another big party. Yeah, well, I, I just hope that they make sure that um, all the food containers are recycle, recyclable yeah. and, com and compostable. Compostable. All right. Mr. B, was it last week you were uh, sort of uh, up in arms about mosquitoes? Has your mosquito problem been uh, resolved? <laughs> no, you, you never get it resolved, but it is much reduced. It is. So it means, it means that the activities of the vector control division in sealing that septic tank within a 400 meter radius of my residence did in fact make an impact. And so um, the, the, the swarms of mosquitoes 
Um, I'm not seeing them anymore. But naturally, mosquitoes are a fact of life. Yeah. You know, I have to say I'm very, very fortunate. Um, there have hardly been any mosquitoes around here in, uh, in recent times, and for that I'm very thankful. Something else you have uh, bunged away on are the derelict vehicles around the country. Uh, well, I think, I think everybody can tell you that that situation is getting worse and worse. It is? Yep. And, and it doesn't appear that... Um, uh, Despite the statements that were made by the Minister of Health a year or more than a year ago, it seems that they don't have the capacity to do what they're supposed to do. I was told by the police officer that what is required is that um, notices are placed on these derelict vehicles and that the owners have a period of maybe two weeks to, to get rid of them. But um, I don't know. And if you want to see where some of these derelict vehicles are ending up, you, you can drive through woodlands and they are stacked four high. I don't know if the owner of that property or if, if he has some idea that he's going to export them as scrap metal, I don't know. But... Um, Clearly, vehicles have become disposable items in this country, given the rate at which they mash them up on the road and the rate at which we continue to import them. Do you remember how long it took to get the derelict boats away from the Lagoon Road or the uh, Karani James Boulevard? you remember? There were a lot of boats sitting there for years. Derelict. Yes, and then and then when the when it was necessary to move them, they moved them mm -hmm. because because the developer in the area needed to have it done. Okay, so have you have you seen have you seen the continuing development taking place? <laughs> yes, there? No. Sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. It What's the? I don't know if they're reclaiming land. I don't, I don't know exactly what is happening, but activity is is taking place without a doubt well yeah and uh, we the public will officially be the last to know one more question i have for you uh, before i let you go sir noise noise pollution <laughs> has that has there been a reduction in noise pollution in this country from your perspective Fortunately, fortunately, where I live, I'm in a sheltered area below the top of a hill so that sounds from the stadium pass over my head, thankfully. Because generally sounds from the stadium go on until 5 or 5.30 a.m. For the life of me, I cannot understand why it is necessary for shows to commence close to midnight. But nevertheless, that is what it is. And so that, I am insulated from that. God help the people who live in River Road Heights, or San Susi, or Mount Gay. You know, the reason why I brought that up is because uh, a couple of nights ago on Beyond the Headlines, a superintendent of police was uh, speaking about the noise uh, pollution problem here and uh, unfortunately I tuned in like you know just like five minutes or so before the program ended but I got there just in the nick of time to hear him start mentioning that he too has been a victim of noise and um, I tried phoning and dialing and dialing and dialing no 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 I couldn't get in because they had stopped taking calls. So I have extended an invitation to this gentleman to join me here on Sunday. And uh, we're going to talk about the noise pollution because the host of the program cut him off just before he explained what he was doing um, in relation to him being subjected to noise pollution. And I really wanted to hear, you know, how he was dealing with it uh, when there's so many people all over this country. Look, 
A.B., it got to the point where we had an organization called Citizens Against Noise. Actually, we are the people who pushed for the noise for the legislation. For the legislation, okay? And last year, a very prominent lawyer in this town told me that after all these years, about 10 years, nobody's been charged uh, <laughs> with, uh, you know, violating that uh, legislation. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm really anxious to have a little tete-a-tete -tete with this gentleman on uh, Sunday. I spoke with him very briefly yesterday, and he willingly, gladly, I can't say I know the man, never met him in person, but mm -hmm. gladly accepted the invitation, and I welcome that. And I'm really looking to have a little heart-to-heart -heart with him on Sunday. So join yeah. us on Sunday. I would, like, I would like to hear what he has to say, and in particular... How it is that they've not managed to prosecute anyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that concerns me. I know that, you know, when we put the legislation together, I had been suggesting that we use noise meters to measure noise levels, okay? Yeah. Uh, but they insisted, they, meaning the police, insisted that we use what they called the test of reasonableness. A.B., a man like you, what's noise to you ain't noise to me, and vice versa, okay? Well, clearly, the man who drove by my residence at 7.20 a.m., what the noise that was coming from his vehicle, I found most unreasonable because I could hear him from two corners away, and I could hear him long after he passed. So I found that quite unreasonable that he should choose to share his choice in music, in quotation marks, with everybody within, in this case, a half mile radius, because it's quarter mile one way, quarter mile behind and quarter mile in front. I mean, it really is ridiculous. I do not understand how someone can have this level of noise and still be in charge of a motor vehicle being driven on our public roads. Yeah. A.B., you've been to the studio. You know this place lock up. I mean, sometimes I could be sitting in here sometimes at midnight. Traffic going by out here, man, and I could tell you the lyrics of every song that's being played. <laughs> I, you know, it, it's ridiculous. Anyhow, they insisted on the test of reasonableness. A.B., we still went out and bought we begged for money and a mm. few business places uh, maybe yours at the time was one of them gave us a few dollars and we went out and bought noise meters for these guys they may use it now uh i think it was last year or year before i heard a police officer saying that the reason why they have not been able to enforce the legislation is because they really need to have noise meters. Oh, please, A.B., come on. Uh, let's put it this way. It has taken 10 years. <laughs> You're trying to tell me don't hold my breath, right? Well, I'm thinking about the 30 years for the carnage to be underwater. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bajinski. Go do your work, sir. Go enjoy your retirement. Thanks a lot, okay. Alan. Okay, bye now. Take care. Mr. Alan Bajinski there. And by the way, for those of you who, uh, well, that's all of you who missed the program this morning, give me another, let's see here, it's 12 minutes to the hour. Give me another 15 minutes or so, and it will be up on Facebook, and it's also going to be up on uh YouTube, a little later on today, okay? So there you have it. All right, folks, let's take a little break and we'll come on back with the National Report. My name is Jennifer James and I've been making confectionaries for the past seven years. Growing up as a little girl, I always wanted to make these little things. Forge, sugar cake, tamarind ball, these little things. I read something actually and it said that tamarind itself is very good because it eliminates fat from the liver. You get the macho tamarind and you crack it, you shell it out. I would add a little baking soda, some spices. I would leave it to rest probably for about two hours and then add my sugar and just start kneading. 
I usually knead it hard enough so that I can roll it. When I finish roll it, I will paste it with the actual white or brown sugar. And you have a nice tamarind ball. I have been providing food here with tamarind ball about six years now. I started producing tamarind ball to sell for the school children. I thought I could advance somewhere. So I went to food fair and I asked one of the salespersons there to if they would be interested in selling my tamarind ball. And um, she told me yes. She told me I'm to bring 20 packets to start with. It was really a joy for me because I wanted to extend on my little business. My name is Jennifer James and I work with the food fair to provide you with tamarind balls. Boyo, they got fly with kite now. The wind picking up. I'm coming, I'm coming. Kaim, what are you doing? Fly my kite. Yeah, but not here. You can't fly a kite near power lines, boy. Why not? The wind good. Because mommy say, kite treads conduct electricity. Yeah, kite. It's right. If your kite gets stuck in power lines, you can cause power outages, or even worse, you can get shocked. Come, let's go and fly them in the pasture. Yeah, that makes sense. Kite threads conduct electricity. Do not fly kites near overhead power lines. This can lead to electric shocks and power outages. If your kite gets stuck in power lines, do not try to retrieve it. Release it and call Grenlec. Always fly kites in open areas. Keep your kites far away from roads. And remember, always clean up after yourself. Grenlec, energizing our Grenada. I'm always on the move. Training, traveling, competing. So it's good to know I have Quap Bank in the palm of my hand. Introducing e-banking, one of many customer convenience services from Grenada Cooperative Bank. And there's more to come. It's swift, simple, and secure. Significant improvements in the quality of broadband access for Grenada and its dependencies. We'll have details to this story and more in the National Report. With the details to the news for Wednesday, May 15th, I am Rakesha St. Louis. Grenada and its dependencies will soon boast of significant improvements in the quality of broadband access, which will be facilitated under the Caribbean Regional Communications Infrastructure Program, CASIP. The World Bank-funded project has been executed by Digicel on behalf of the governments of Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This phase of the project will include the installation of marine fiber optic cable is been done by the Canadian-based company International Telecoms. The project will increase access to regional broadband network by bringing true broadband connectivity to schools, community centers, and government offices. It will also advance development of an ICT-enabled services industry in the three beneficiary countries. During a press conference on Wednesday morning ahead of the start of installation of the subsea cables, Minister for Infrastructure Development and Public Utilities, Honorable Gregory Bowen, said this is a major milestone for Grenada that paves the way for the inclusion of advanced technology in the future development of the country. He said each sector stands to benefit from this project. Our children being able to work online, our examinations being done online, no buffering, Lecturing, I've always advocated that the best mathematics teachers should teach mathematics to the entire people. 
in Grenada and perhaps the region. We can do this now with broadband. So we sit in one school and the teacher lectures to everyone because of the technology. The opportunities are great. Jobs from one location, working for persons in other locations, other countries, this can manifest itself from what we have now, our broadband system. Karakou, we are especially pleased with Karakou because with all the development, they have never had the opportunity for real broadband, always a radio link. Project Offshore Installation Manager for International Telecoms, Todd Nichols, said the installation process will commence on Thursday. He said the cables will be laid on the seabed from Conference Bay, St. Andrew, to the east of Kikamjini, going on to Hillsborough, Kariku. We anticipate getting underway tomorrow. Um, from here over to conference uh, late tomorrow and spending all day Friday on site doing some trials and prepping the beach. From there, um, we hope to get underway Saturday morning, which would put us into Karakou on Sunday. Um, we will see how time uh, goes, but the uh, Karakou segment, that's 53 kilometers in length. That is the longest segment of, of this particular project. And, uh, but we anticipate being able to have that completed by Sunday. So, um, yeah, we're, uh, we're very excited about participating with, with everybody here. Siobhan Redhead, CEO of Digicel Grenada Limited, said she's pleased that Digicel and the government can collaborate to enhance the technology of the future. Being introduced via fiber subsea, which you guys are here responsible for laying, which will be connected to our terrestrial um, fiber on the ground, will not only provide a tremendous capacity, unprecedented capacity for our network and off-island resiliency. Sorry, off-island capacity and network resiliency. Now, this technology will provide the bandwidth for tomorrow's technology. It will not only change the way we evolve in terms of how we communicate, it will change the way we're able to deliver education in schools and it will also change the way we run our businesses. And that's something we have to acknowledge across Grenada, Karakou, Piti Martinique, the Grenadines, and by default, St. Lucia and St. Vincent through this CASA project. Following the press conference, government and digital officials were given a tour of the telecoms cable ship to get an understanding of the installation process. International telecoms officials say installation of cables process will be eco-friendly, minimizing harm to the ecosystem. The entire process of installation and testing will take approximately five weeks. The Blue Innovation Institute through the Ministry of Climate Resilience and the New York University will host the first in a series of Climate Smart City Expo on the Carnage in front of the Financial Complex St. George's on Friday. The activity, which runs from 12 to 9 p.m., will include a visual expo of the challenges of climate change and the potential solutions. Dr. Angus Friday, co-chair of the Blue Innovation Institute, says it has become necessary to host the expo to encourage dialogue and increase sensitization about the issues of climate change. We're working with the Green Climate Fund and New York University on this, and once we get past this initial uh, hurdle, um, Grenadians themselves will have the technical capabilities to be able to replicate this uh, in other towns and urban areas around Grenada, Caracol and Pity Martin. Dr. Friday says the New York University has been a technical supporter throughout the project and representatives will be on hand to share information on their findings. They have come up with um, a, a narrative around some of the challenges uh, related to sea level rise and solutions for things like urban densification, uh, a lot of the traffic that we're seeing building up now is also part and parcel of the problem. But if we can come up with solutions for this, it would put Grenada uh, very much ahead. Solutions related to uh, new forms of public transport, uh, e-mobility, uh, and so forth. By e-mobility, I'm talking about uh, electric mobility. So uh, uh, these are some of the things that uh, people will be learning about. One of the interesting initiatives undertaken in the project by the New York University was to put tide gauges in the harbor at Grenville and St. George's. We took that data 
and sent it off to NASA. That's the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the United States. They did some very interesting modeling, basically showing us that the carronage is in danger uh, of being underwater in a few years' time, just as a result of storm surge. I think sometimes we already see the waves coming over the carronage. So this is a huge concern. And by 2050, it'll be completely underwater. So uh, we need to begin to take steps now to uh, 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 put in place the solutions that would uh, not only deal with a problem, but would actually help to attract more investment more life, more activity. The Climate Smart Cities Expo will begin at 12 noon with various presentations at different intervals during the afternoon prior to the cultural package and the lighting of the buildings on the Carinage. This is the National Report. We'll have more news after the break. Data reveals that rats and other rodents are responsible for the transmission of many diseases. In Grenada, the most common is leptospirosis, and it can cause your death. This disease is directly related to rats and mice infestation. Signs and symptoms of lepto, as it is commonly referred to, are high fever, headache, chills, muscle aches, vomiting, jaundice, and abdominal pain. If your home had or is infected with rats and you have any of these symptoms, please check with your doctor immediately. Declare war on rats. Starve them. Kill them. Rats are the most unwelcomed guests. Reduce, control, eliminate them. This is a message from the Ridge to Reef Project, protecting biodiversity and ecosystem functions. Welcome back. CARICOM foreign ministers who met in Grenada this week are calling on the European Union to adopt a more collaborative approach with regard to the subject of blacklisting. The ministers who met at the Radisson Resort say the EU's approach to tax governance is inappropriate. They say the relevant agency to deal with these matters is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Forum for Harmful Tax Practices, which is inclusive in allowing other member states to be present and to be consulted. The foreign ministers also touched on a wide range of topics ranging from climate change to border issues. On the subject of Venezuela, the ministers reaffirmed the guiding principles of non-interference and non-intervention in its affairs. Foreign Minister Honorable Peter David addressed the subject at the conclusion of the two-day meeting on Tuesday. It's in kids leading uh, Trinidad and Tobago Barbados involved and Koftor merely reiterated the position that we call for dialogue in Venezuela and we are urging the parties together. Fortunately for us, over the last five months, we've found that many of the countries who previously advocated war and intervention are now agreeing to the CARICOM's position and they are more accepting CARICOM's position recently manifested in the visit by uh, the St. Kitts Prime Minister Timothy Harris to, uh, to, to Latin America, where he had engagements not only with Latin American countries who are calling for dialogue, but also with some of the European countries who have now accepted that position. That story just ended the National Report for today, Wednesday, May 15th. Let's recap the top story. Significant improvements in the quality of broadband access for Grenada and its dependencies. On behalf of everyone here at the Government Information Service who made this newscast possible, I am Rikisha St. Louis saying thank you for joining us. Until next time.
Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Together with you, our customers, we energize our community. Together with you, we energize our economy. We are working together to give our nation a better tomorrow. With you, we energize our future. Together, we energize our nation. Thank you for partnering with us as we energize our Spice Island. Redneck, energizing our Grenada. Alrighty, folks, you're not there to comment on the uh, national report this morning. So uh, we're just going to move right along. Now, I mentioned to you at the top of the program that I wanted to take a few moments here this morning to say thank you. I want to thank you for taking the time, whether it's on a Sunday morning, on weekdays in the morning, on Thursday evenings, whenever, even on Mondays uh, with Regulus Ferguson, for joining me here on Grenada Broadcast. I really do appreciate that. I also want to thank you for helping to spread the word about us over the past year for contributing to our good governance agenda. I really do appreciate that. You know, when you make comments on uh, Facebook or wherever, people listen, people listen. But I especially want to thank you for reaching out to me in my time of need. It's uh, been just a little over a year now since we've been doing this particular program. Sundays with George Grant is now into its 15th year. And a lot of you have been with us for those 14 plus years. And you've seen everything we've gone through. But we're still here. We're still here. Thanks to you. Toi. Okay? And this morning, I'm no singer. But I thought, you know, I came across a track. Uh, this has been one of my favorites for years now. And uh, I think it best expresses what I'd really, really like to say. I'm not a singer, so I'm not going to sit here and scare the stuffing out of you by trying to sing. But I want you to listen to this because it really talks about the way that I feel about you.
sums it up. Enough said. Thank you, Grenada. Parting word today comes to you from the first book of John, John chapter 4, verses 2, 3, and 4. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. A reading from 1 John chapter 4, verses 2, 3, and 4. My dear pilgrims, that's going to do it on this Thursday morning. Go on back and listen to the program. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Hopefully... We'll have smooth sailing tomorrow. <laughs> Brian Pitson tomorrow. God knows. God knows. We just have to be prepared. Take it one day at a time. God bless you.